And welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 156. If you're looking to improve your understanding of photography, then you're in the right place. Make sure you click subscribe, the little notification bell, like, always like the video. Those things always go down rather well with the YouTube algorithms. Um, and if you happen to be watching this live now, you leave a leave a comment. There's a chat box here. You can say hello. Um, tell me where you're from. Tell me what the weather's like where you are. And... Uh, we can make a start. Today I'm going to be talking about a photo that was sort of a little bit accidentally Wes Anderson. Um, so I thought we could sort of explore that photo and talk about the kind of ideas and tropes and how we might introduce that into our photography. I've also had two people send in images for critique and feedback, so we'll be looking at them as well. So, see you in a moment. Oh, actually, where was I? Yes, that one. Maybe one day I'll be wealthy enough to have somebody else to press these buttons for me. And, I won't <laughs> and it won't be the standard problem of always never entirely sure what my left hand should be doing while I'm trying to talk to you over there. Right. So, yes, here we are live on YouTube, unless you happen to be watching the recording. Uh, if you are watching the recording and this is maybe your first time, then understand that there is also 155 previous episodes you can dip into right here on this YouTube channel. Um, but also, you know, you can join us on, we, there's a Facebook group also called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, uh, which you can join, which when pe people are wanting to submit images or questions uh, during the week, then they can. So I can see we've got a couple of people in already, a couple of comments, what have you got? Oh, Pat says, lovely day in Minehead, hi all. Rosemary says, good morning, a lovely morning here in Washington State. Maggie says, hello, sunny and warm here in South West Scotland. Uh, Rob is joining us saying, howdy all from Texas. And Andy is joining saying, hey, from a sunny Bishop Stortford. That's excellent. Great. We have people in. And um, yes, for, for those of uh, those of you who are in Britain enjoying the really warm, sunny weather here, certainly up in Scotland, it's been fat, rather fabulous. We did actually have lightning and thunderstorms last night, but following uh, really hot, 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 hot sunny days here, reaching as high as 26, 27, possibly even 28 degrees Celsius. And for those of you who think that's hot, which like us in Scotland, we do, please bear a, th <laughs> bear a thought for poor VG in India, who yesterday I was chatting to and told me they've got temperatures of 44 Celsius, which I just can't even begin to get my head around. I don't think I've ever actually experienced temperatures that high um, outside of a sauna. Oh, April's joined us. Uh, also says hello, everyone, from a warm Long Island, New York. Right. So today, yes. Um, what I'm going to do, we're going to talk a little. We'll do, I think we'll do the critique first. And then I want to talk a little bit about this idea of... Um, a kind of Wes Anderson style photo. Now, for anybody who's not entirely sure, Wes Anderson is a director. He's, a, he's done several films called, uh, well, the likes of The French Dispatch was one of the more recent ones, um, The Grand Budapest Hotel, um, The Life Aquatic with Steve Suzu. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of films out there which, once you start watching them, you start to realise he's got a very, very specific style, a very particular look. Um, which he implements into his films. If you like it, then you will tend to really like it. And if you don't like it, you will just find it intensely irritating. Um, so Wes Anderson, so it's started to become a case of whether in filmmaking or in photography, the idea of giving something a bit of a Wes Anderson look. And so that's what I'm going to be exploring a little bit. Um, so, well, maybe do I start there? Maybe I should just start there actually. Um, so I think, uh, yes, I'll, I'll tell you what, let's let's start there. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of uh, sort of Wes Anderson. Oh, hang on a second, what's this? Robert says, I love Wes Anderson. He's from Dallas as well. Is he? Well, I didn't realise that. <laughs> um, right, so let me click there, click there, click there. And what I'm going to do then is, oh, Meg's also said hello everyone from very warm Castle Douglas. Um, <laughs> I was hoping Meg might, I mean, she's only downstairs. Mind you, it might be a warm castle, Douglas. I will just let you know that our living room is sort of downstairs below entrance ground level. There is a, a door then opened into the garden. It's a kind of strange thing, but it's something of a cool pool. So it wouldn't matter if it was 44 degrees outside. You would still need to put on an extra sweater when you go into our living room. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's cold. Um, however... Where are I? Um, uh, yes, so um, 
Uh, what have we got? Oh, Pat says hope it improves soon. April. Um, oh, right. OK, no, that's responding to April saying Wednesday was terrible. It was like a sci fi flick. It smelled like smoke and fire. If you, ah, of course, you've been having the big wildfires over there. Yes. Hope every, hope you're safe where you are. Um, Robert says, well, Houston, uh, not Texas yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is Houston not count as Texas? Um, and it will say much better this weekend, back to normal. OK, well, that's good. Right. So let's move on. Then. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to talk about photo shoot I did. Now, it's the, it's the photo that um, for those of you who are on Facebook or saw any of the um, coming up this week, I, I decided to use for promoting this particular podcast. And um, the well, OK, let's let's just show you here the photo that I'm talking about. So it's this one now. Essentially, what I did was I, I did a, a photo shoot with um, Phil and Annalise, a lovely couple, and I've done more photos with them, which at a later date I'm gonna I'll show you, talk you through. Uh, but they haven't been put up on it yet anywhere on social media. Now we went down to uh, this is in Air, um, which is on the the west coast. Well, it's southwest coast of Scotland. It's on the west side, um, but below Glasgow. Oh, anyway, the thing was, we took this at, it was in the end of April, and while it was a clear sunny day, um, it wasn't particularly warm. You can see they're actually wearing jackets. Um, and a whole, we were kind of going to be doing a bunch of narrative photos, again, slightly cinematic, but not this style of cinematic. We were actually kind of going from slightly more um, gritty, uh, gritty realism um, kind of feel with the idea of a slight melancholy, probably the way I will um, edit those photos will be slightly desaturated. However, what happened was, and in fact, let me just show you um, if I click on that. This is the original photo. So I start, uh, we went down to air and while, just while we were, um, we sort of got to the sea wall, you've got the sea behind. I did a couple of shots of them sitting on the sea wall and then they started kind of playing around. And we were kind of, you know, I took a, I took a few shots and I, I quite like this idea of creating layers of a kind of sort of very often. I mean, you know, a lot of the way that I will do photos is I like angles and lines and lines that kind of lead you deep into the into the imagery. But this idea of a kind of flat on I sort of I sort of noticed there and I had a little bit of this notion that it's it's a feature that the director Wes Anderson very often does. He's not one for sort of doing angles into strange corners and weird kind of above and below shots and distorted shots. It's not. Um, he he part of his very distinctive style is that he tends to shoot very kind of flat on. He also as um, contrary to your starting point with photography, which is very often rule of thirds. He doesn't go rule of thirds at all. He tends to put all the action smack bang in the middle of the photo. And this was sort of playing around in the back of my head with this. I thought, well, OK, what if I do this? What if I kind of emulate this a little bit? And I put the action smack bang in the middle of the photo. We've got Annalise and Phil playing around. There's a little kind of quirkiness to it. I quite like the, the little clouds that are sort of floating about in the blue sky at the background. And what can we then do with this photo? And when I kind of got back um, and really started playing around with it, in fact, actually, what I'll do, I, I will show you the um, Photoshop file. And so the first thing that I did was I cropped it. And um, now is this going to open? Yep. Yeah. So you can see that what I've done is I've gone from, I'll close that one, from, so from here and I've cropped it and I might have just straightened that horizon just a fraction. Now, part of the problem with now I wanted this, I wanted to get them in exactly the middle. You can see they're very fractionally off here and that meant trimming a little bit over on the left. And that meant that I lost a little bit of that headland, which I quite liked that headland. So what I did then was I, um, I added it back in. I kind of pulled the photo out, cropped it and just sort of stuck it back in. Um, and so from there, I thought, well, OK, that's quite good. I quite like that that shape now. And that's because I've, I've got the symmetry, that little bit of asymmetry that we've talked about before, where it's not absolutely balanced. Now, although having said that, I was looking at this and while I was exploring, I noticed I really quite liked this little line here, this this sort of this bit of crack in the pavement down here. 
sort of led up to sort of led up to the back of uh, Annalise here. And I thought what I would really quite like is, is something that's echoing here. There's a little bit of line there, but it's not really strong. And I wanted it slightly over to the left. So what I did was I took that bit of line and I swapped it over and played around with it. And I stuck it here. And so just if you look down in this corner down here, you can see that I just, and it's a very subtle little thing and something most people wouldn't notice. And what it does is it creates another line coming up towards Phil here. So we're creating a triangle that's running up like this in contrary to everything else being horizontal and verticals. But it just allowed me, in a way, what it does is it just frames these two a fraction more. And it's very subtle, but I kind of, I, it, I felt it just lifted everything a bit. So then I selected all those and put those together. And then I went for the vibrant and I clicked on the vibrant and I just basically took the saturation and I whacked it up by about, four, well, in that case, 47%. And I took the vibrancy and whacked it up. So if you think of, you know, normally it would have been like that. I just put that up to full and I put that up to 47 or thereabouts. And I thought, wow, suddenly it's like these, these colors absolutely pop. And there's another aspect to um, Wes Anderson, which is his color palettes are very often, um, he's using kind of pastel colors. And I'm thinking we've got the blue and we've got the pink and we've got the yellow. Now this is just a bit too strong. I need to kind of tone this down a little bit. So I, next layer I did was, I just sort of softened that down a bit, left it kind of slightly stronger at the top and the bottom, but the yellow here was too strong. The, the sky was too strong. So I just toned that down a fraction. Then I thought, well, okay, in the usual way of things, um, the face is getting over, the body's a little bit here. I just kind of decided to selectively bring up some of the shadows in here. And then a the last bit here was I wanted to just lighten up these. These faces have gone a little bit yellow. I wanted to color shift the faces and also highlight a little bit here. And then I kind of, so I lightened that and kind of took out some of the yellow on the faces as well. Then now having this, the next thing I did was I lightened the whole thing because if we go to here, we can see, um, you know, there was a bit of a gap yeah, over on the right. So I sort of pulled that up. Uh, to get the histogram so that we've got the right levels of lightness and then a final just a little bit of hue saturation i just wanted to kind of i felt these yellows were just a little bit too strong for what i wanted so i kind of made them slightly paler and slightly lighter and ultimately then this is the photo we ended up with so that combination of first of all i've gone for a wider cinematic crop so it's if you think of your normal photo, which is a kind of two by three ratio, this is a more one by 1.85 or something like that, um, rather than a one by 1.5. So there's a wider screen element. We've got the kind of pastel colors, but boosted and saturated. We've got everything flat on, not at a slight angle. And then that's giving us sort of layers. We've got the pavement, we've got the wall, now on the wall, and then we've got the sea and the sky behind them. So a very kind of flat thing. And then all the action is happening smack bang in the middle. And ultimately then this is the this is the picture we end up with. And I thought it was so it was kind of fun. So there's there's a there's a whole um what do you call um, there's a whole, it's sort of, I've, I discovered there's actually a movement, no, no, movement's too strong, but there's, there's, well, there's a hashtag on Instagram called accidentally Wes Anderson. Um, and it's where you take photos where people have taken photos and they suddenly think, and they think, oh, you know, that looks a bit like a kind of a still from a Wes Anderson movie. Um, and I started thinking, well, okay, what are these tropes? And that's when I went away and investigated. So by and large, if you're wanting to kind of emulate that idea of a sort of Wes Anderson movie relatively easily, that your key points are shoot flat on. So you're not kind of looking into diagonals and corners and, and, and strange bits. You go flat. The next thing is think about your color scheme. Your color scheme, very often it's pastels. It might be slightly oversaturated pastels, but he tends to have particular color palettes. He's rarely using much more than about three colors, possibly four um, strong colors in, in any particular scene that he's using. And very often they tend to be quite, uh, well, pastel, but also quite saturated. Um, and then also this notion of everything happening in the middle. 
And I think that's, you know, kind of a key trope, if you like, of um, the Wes Anderson style photos. And so when you combine and then you can give it a cinematic crop, make it wider and, uh, and, and you combine these things together and suddenly you end up with something that looks a bit Wes Anderson. So I think it's in, in your kind of toolbox or something to play with, uh, with your photography, it's a fun one to have. And uh, in a couple of weeks time, a few weeks time, I've got different, uh, this, over the next few weeks, I've got other photo shoots and bits that I'm going to be showing you. Um, and at some point, what I'm also planning to do is I'm going to really investigate this idea of sort of how to make your photos look a bit more cinematic in general. And I'll talk, I'll go into more in depth there about cinematic ratios, um, explorations of, of how to how to make your images that sort of that bit more cinematic. Um, but this is so think of this as a kind of introduction to if you've never seen any Wes Anderson movies, um, but you've got streaming services, you know, like Netflix or Amazon, look him up. I would say watch, uh, see how you get on. If you find it's not for you, then fine. It's not going to be for you. I think if you find once you start getting into his rhythms, um, he's a fun director to follow. So that's kind of what I want to say about that. Um, I can see I've got com more comments uh, have come in. What else have we got here? Um, so uh, John's joined us and says hello from Ohio. Um, uh, Stacy said, sorry, I'm late. Beautiful morning. We had the bad smog due to the Canadian wildfires and finally ran uh, rain sort of cleared the heavy smell and haze. They will be in the mid to high 80s. Clear sunny skies. Welcome um, back to Stacy. Stacy's in Hatboro, Pennsylvania. Um, April says, I love the pose in this photo. Pat says, lovely sky. Uh, Robert says, uh, you could have a future f <laughs> future career as a director of photography. Yeah, I wouldn't say no, to be honest. It could be quite fun. Um, I think so. I have thought before. I was in conversation with somebody quite recently about this, about would I ever get into doing film? At the moment, I'm very happy with photography. I can imagine if I ever got really felt like I'd reached the limits of what I could do with photography, I can imagine getting into film as another way of exploring, because then it's photography but moving. Um, However, there's still always so much to investigate with photography. I do enjoy my photography so much that at the moment that's not on the horizon, if it ever will be. Um, but yes, I'll take that as a, um, a sort of validation there, Robert. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully that's given you a couple of ideas there and a few things to kind of play around with. So... Um, so, yes, if you are we reminder then if you happen to be finding these podcasts useful, interesting or entertaining and you would like to support them at all, then buy me a coffee dot com forward slash Kim Ayers. At the moment, I don't have any sponsor. I suppose this is where the sponsors message would come in normally. <laughs> Should be advertising something. No sponsors have ever come forth for this podcast. If you happen to know any point them in this direction as well. Definitely up for a bit of sponsorship. Uh, but in the meantime, my, I guess my no, <laughs> buy me a coffee is the closest I get to that. Um, what else have we got? Yes. Uh, and also, of course, tell your friends. Tell your friends about it. You, you, you like photography. You have friends who like photography too. I'm sure if you enjoy these podcasts, I'm sure they would as well drag them along. Right. So what are we going to do now? We're going to move on to the critique section or the feedback section. And uh, then I'll tell you, well, I still haven't decided 100% what I'm doing next week. But I've got a couple of ideas. A little bit depends on, I might be going away for a uh, for a week, in which case there will be a weekend disappeared out of this sometime in the next few weeks. Ah, still waiting on people to get back to me, all sorts of other things. I don't know whether it's definitely happening. That might affect the order of what happens next. Do you need to know all this? This is just me speaking out loud. Well, I suppose. Yeah. Thinking out loud. That's the phrase. Right. OK, let's move on. So the pictures I wanted to, to look at today. So um, really, I, I let's, let's send it. First of all, we have VG. So VG sent me this photo and she said, where are we? She said, this photo is of two coconut palm leaves, a short tree. I liked the angle I took it uh, and the sunlight was on the other side of the leaves. So she's getting this kind of nice backlight coming through the leaf there. I took it from the our side of the compound wall. The tree belonged to our neighbour. Uh, so yeah, overhanging foliage from the <laughs> from next door. I'm sure I've done that kind of thing too. Uh, please comment on the angle and the lighting. I did not have any angle, other angle to take. I thought it looked a bit like a hand fan. Well, I think there's, um, there's something quite fun about this, Fiji. And I... Um, 
we've got these, these lines here. We've got these other lines in the foreground. These kind of all lean up, lead up to it. It's quite abstract. I would say the only real shame about this is the fact that it's sort of full of dust and dirt. And I think if you wanted to, the, 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 the abstract level of this or the potential for the, just turning this into that little bit more abstract, um, I think is kind of there. It's almost worth, I would say, if you were taking this photo genuinely to, to go out with a little spray of water or a damp cloth and literally wipe the leaves down. Um, and I, I think, uh, because terrible to say it, but it's true. When I look at this photo, I see these lovely lines and I see the potential, but I get completely distracted by the dust that's on it. Um, and I think really, if that was just cleaned up, you would then be onto something which was that bit, the dust wouldn't be distracting. And then it becomes an interesting photo. Now, interestingly, another aspect, another photo ver version of this that VG took was this. And I think you're really onto something here as well. And I love that notion of just taking the leaf shapes where if you don't really know what it is, you can see that it's green, you can tell that it's a leaf, but you're not really that much sure beyond that. Now, if you happen to know your coconut palms, then I'm sure you would recognize it. Coconut palms aren't something we tend to have kicking around in this part of uh, this corner of Southwest Scotland. So it's not a leaf I'm familiar with. Um, quite what you do, I, I like I said, I kind of think I prefer this one to, um, to the other one, uh, partly because of the fact that I'm not distracted by the, but also because we, the other one would take too long to clean up in Photoshop. This one, on the other hand, wouldn't take very much to clean up. I mean, I think if I just sort of basically grab the little spot heel tool and I come down here, something just as similar, as simple as just taking out these little gray bits here. There's a couple of little, um, just tiny little, distractions anything which is just a dot that's just big enough to kind of grab my eye so that I end up looking at the dot you see you know if you take a dot like this for example the part of the problem is is you've got a light patch in a dark patch so it does grab the eye and we're not really wanting it to grab the eye that little dot isn't the narrative of the story so just taking it out take out a little bit up there and you know I mean, there's maybe a couple of little black bits up there, but I don't know that these ones are quite so distracting. You can get to a point whereby, you know, but I think just something like that becomes really interesting. Now I'm going to duplicate that layer. And another thing I would quite like to do, I would just like to see what it does. If I go to image auto tone, that's interesting, image auto color. So we kind of go from that really vivid green to it's, what's interesting is the way that the auto color has shifted. It's, made, it's allowed the outer bits to be slightly yellower, the inner bits to be slightly bluer. Um, whereas this kind of looks like the same tone of green all the way through. If you look really closely, the outer bits are fractionally yellower, the inner bits are fractionally bluer, but it's so, mm, you really gotta know what you're looking for. Whereas actually, if you use the auto color and auto tone, that kind of creates that, which I, I quite like. And then I think, well, let's say we went to, what are the levels doing? You could maybe brighten it up a bit. Or if you're really playing around with this notion of contrast, if we go to the brightness contrast on this, I think you could take the contrast and you could, you could play around with that, something like that. Brightness you can take down, oh, that becomes sort of quite interesting. Actually bring it down and then the highlights from the edge of these leaves becomes even more if we kind of just push that contrast up something like that and i think you know so there's actually kind of a number of ways you can really play with this another option is even to maybe drop it into black and white if i do uh say a gradient map something like that and do it on classic rather than um then that abstracts it even more we're not even necessarily sure that it is you know the, it's the green is the giveaway that it's a leaf once you go black and white it could be pretty much anything um and again your contrast is all your brightness is going to make is going to play around with different kinds of uh levels of interest so i think really there vg that i you know i really like this shape and i think there's a lot of potential in it all uh, my only real suggestion clean up one or two of those little bits which just kind of grab the attention when you're not looking for it and then really play play with the you know if you want to play with the color 
levels or you want to play with the brightness or contrast or even put it in black and white or play around with the auto settings on the color i think there's a, there's a lot there's several different directions you can go so that's really kind of where i, I would suggest with that vg but um yeah thank you for sending that one in i think i think that there, there's strength in that one and i think some of these um some of these picture uh some of the uh, so like photo crowd guru shots things there are particular ones where that abstract or that plant life or that use of diagonals things like that uh it would work really well actually a little bit of a side here um is <laughs> no i'll come i'll tell you what i'll tell you that aside in a moment just as my head goes off but i will come back to i've, I've got um comments in here uh first of all um where have we got uh, rosemary says vg this is a great entry for the for a green contest um april says she likes the cliff look yes that kind of idea that that the first one was going in originally almost like dropping off stacy says i love the intense uh the free intense green um amg oh that's ann right hi ann <laughs> says nice abstract vg uh rosemary says agreed that second image is wonderful uh maggie says i love the second photo vg uh stacy says the second image is better the green is lush and the diagonal lines are a nice addition uh, April says, I love the abstract. I love abstract photos like this. Meg says, I really like diagonals in the photo. Uh, Rosemary says, mm, I like the original green over the black and white, all the color, color shifted ones, and then maybe play with the contrast. The original green is so fresh and says paradise. And that's fair enough. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing is what you do is you play with it in a way that makes it feel. I, I suppose I get drawn slightly more to that sort of slightly softened green from the fact that that's a green that I'm more familiar with. Uh, that sort of slightly more yellowish green as such. Um, I mean, I can look out here, out the window. In fact, we have a small palm tree sitting almost across the road out my window outside the library. It looks slightly tatty on the edges and a bit worse for wear, but and this isn't natural palm tree country, but it's always been there. And that green there has that sort of slightly more yellowish tinge to it. Uh, that bluish kind of vibrant green like that isn't one that I'm so familiar with so maybe that's why I get attracted to it hmm. interesting so yes play around with these things these these photos are really for all I'm doing is throwing up suggestions um, but what's great about photography is the fact that we all have our different interpretations on these so uh, yeah interesting point there Rosemary now the um, the tangent I was going to go off on something I suddenly remembered about the Wes Anderson style of thing is what I was going to say is on Guru Shots last week, uh, I suggested the idea of doing a Wes Anderson challenge on um, on Guru Shots. And they accepted it. And suddenly, so I was put in charge for that challenge and I had uh, 100 G uh, GPs, Guru Picks, that I could give out. Um, and I struggled out of three and a half thousand photos that were put in. I struggled to find a hundred that I could properly award it to. I, I think so many people didn't really understand the notion of what a Wes Anderson thing, even though I attempted to describe it in the little description. But you only have, you know, 40 words or something to say something. So, yeah, it's not necessary. It's a strange thing to, that. For me, it was fairly obvious that once you understand these tropes, apply these tropes and suddenly you end up with a picture that looks like the thing you're emulating. Uh, not everybody understood that. And certainly on the on the um, on Guru shots, they they didn't because I'd been kind of half thinking about doing that with photo crowd as well was to do a kind of Wes Anderson challenge. I might still do it, but I might have to change how I describe it. So people think about it. I'm not going to do a Wes Anderson challenge on here, though. Um, but I might do a cinematic challenge. I'm, that's the bit I'm toying with for maybe a few weeks time. But we will talk more cinematic stuff before we come back to that. OK, so next one I want to talk about is uh, Sandra. So Sandra sent in this photo. And she said, um, I recently went on holiday to Norway and the weather was cloudy, overcast and raining. It was some of the worst weather I've had to deal with when taking landscapes. As there, was, as there was still snow on the mountains, resulting in contrasting lighting conditions and parts of the photo highlights being blown out. I did attempt to use the HDR option, that's the um, 
that's where you take the the camera takes three different up up to or sort of at least three different photos at different exposures and then merges them together and then that gives you a greater dynamic range so hdr stands for high dynamic range so that generally speaking it takes one underexposed so that you have more detail in the highlights, one that's slightly overexposed so you have more detail in the shadows and one at a normal range and then it combines the three of them. Actually our phones are very good for that, a lot of our phone photography sort of does an automatic HDR um, to give us a bigger range of uh, images, certainly the, the phones that are kind of less than two years old. Anyway, she goes on. Uh, I'm not sure that, that whether that worked or not and it's something I need to try out and work out how to use properly and then learn to reset the camera when I'm finished. This is true. The HDR option on your camera is individual to each camera. Every camera that might have it, you have to find out where the menu options are, practice it, try it out, and then learn out how learn how you can easily switch it on for when you need it and switch it off for when you don't need it. Um, there's little point in me doing a uh, a podcast about how to how to set that up because it's it's going to be individual to your camera. However, what I would say is here on YouTube there are millions of tutorial photography tutorials uh, all about how to operate your camera. So if you want to say that you've got this make of camera with this model, type that into YouTube and then put HDR settings. Um, then there will be somebody out there, I'm sure, who will show you where your menu items are in order to be able to find it and set it. Okay, let's go back. She says, I attached the original photo, which is a processed color version and a black and white version. So she's also, uh, Sandra's also sent in this black and white version. I think the black and white is more effective, but I would appreciate your feedback to see if there's anything I could have done differently at the time of taking or in Photoshop. So now I th uh, I will say, uh, I mean, first of all, great. I mean, yeah, a little bit of um, travel envy here. The idea of going to Norway. I would love to go to Norway. These fjords, these huge, great valleys, the, the, the sea coming into it. We can see that, you know, we've got the, the, the water coming up, looking very still, reflecting the mountains. And you're going to have a huge, great cruise liner sitting in the bay here. I mean, that is massive. That is a city on on a hull, really. Um, so you know, probably several thousand people being able to sort of be supported in, in that one. Um, so and you're obviously way up high. I don't know whether you walked up there or there was a cable car or you just happened to be flying past. I'm not sure um, you didn't mention that. But you've got this height and you're looking down. And it's a dull overcast day. And what you're what you're saying here is. So I think, you know, the, the, the landscape is obviously a dramatic landscape. You're feeling like you haven't really managed to properly capture that. And one of this, these problems is the exposure. And what we can see is that, you know, you get to a point, we've got the snow line, the snow, the snow is on top of the, the mountains. And you're saying that the overexposure, the, you know, you've kind of exposed for the valley, which has meant that the snow, the highlights have essentially blown out. And what have you, what have you, what you've done here as a way of trying to compensate that is, um, you've cropped off to a part of the top of the mountains. And I think at this point that it's kind of played against you. Um, I think part of the drama of something like this is the mountain tops. You kind of want to see the mountain tops in order to get that extra level of sense of the incredible depth of these fjords, of these valleys. Um, and you know, it's back to it's back to where's the story? What's the story with this? Now there's different potential stories, but your overall story on this is the landscape. It is the fjord. It is the valley. It is the mountains and their relationship to the buildings, the town, um, that's and the port that's right down here. Now this is way too small, but way too pixelated. So your story isn't the cruise ship it's the cruise ship in the town but that in itself isn't enough that's not much of a photo it's, it's fairly interesting but it's not really there it becomes interesting we come out here we're getting more of this we're getting this sense of length and then as we pull out and we start to get a sense of the side of these mountains that's where it's really coming into its own except that we've lost the top of the mountains and i i can't help but feel that you know part of the photo is 
missing because of that. Now, your next point, which is about the, the problem is that while you were focusing the camera down here, the exposure settings were for down here, which meant that it meant that the snow just ended up blowing out. And I think that a little bit here depends on your camera and what you can do. And I can't remember what camera you've got, um, but generally speaking, if you are shooting in RAW and you've got a good enough quality camera, what I would have said is expose for the highlights, expose for the, um, for the snow so that your snow level isn't completely blown. There's enough, still enough detail in the snow and the, the top of the mountains so that it's not going to feel like it's blown highlights. Now, this will in turn make everything a little bit darker, but if you shot in RAW, you, you can usually draw out a lot more detail from the shadows. It tends to be easier to draw more detail out of the shadows than it does out of dark shadows than it does to pull details out of blown highlights. When they're blown, they're kind of blown. You can't seem to get the highlights back. Now, that can happen if things go too dark as well, but quite often is Photoshop and RAW tend to, I've always found, tend to work better to be able to bring the detail out of the shadows. So if in doubt, not always, but in something like this, I would say expose for the highlights. It will mean it's an underexposed valley, but then I think you've got more option to bring the details out. Now, you might have a bit of noise with that. You might then have to use noise reduction options, uh, but I think that's really the way to do it. Now, what you've also tried to do here is you've gone for another one, which is a kind of black and white version. And for me, I, I don't think the black and white works quite so well. I think the problem is with the black and white is there's so many different textures that they kind of end up competing with each other. It's just, it's kind of feels a bit, it's more difficult to separate all what's going out in among the trees and the buildings. They're not quite as obviously separate. Whereas when we have the color, we can at least tell that the you know we've got the gray of the roads and the buildings and that the trees have this kind of uh, and the fields have all these different kind of greens and yellowy green tinges so that helps separate and make more sense of what's going in and on in the picture um i think if we now there's a couple of a uh, couple of different options here as well um where are we just going to zoom in a little bit here uh to the picture i think there's, if I take the levels here, we can see that most of it sitting here, there's a, there's a kind of feeling of, yeah, like it's a little bit pale, like you could actually create maybe a little bit more contrast with this. So what I'm gonna do, let me duplicate that. And I'm just gonna take this into camera raw a bit. Now I know you've already edited it to a degree. I don't know what your original was completely like, but when I look at this, if I click auto, you see that likes to kind of push the highlights down, but bring the shadows up a little bit, push the blacks down a little bit, and also maybe play with the contrast. And actually maybe what I might do is even play with that contrast a little more. And when I do that, I mean, it's making some of these darks darker, but it's sort of creating a much more beautiful kind of contrast over here down on the water, I think. Um, clarity, what would that do? That actually the clarity, I think tends to just overdo the detail. It makes it too busy again. Um, color temperature, if I do auto, mm, not quite so sure on that. Um, in fact, actually it's, there's quite greens in the, you see, you can do the, very often when we're playing with the color temperature, we tend to sort of do the yellow blue slider. And in this case, I don't think that's going to make much difference, but there's a lot of green in here and where there's a green purple slider. Now I don't want it completely purple, but if I just nudge that just a fraction, I'm just going to take that up to sort of eight to 10, I think maybe that little bit of purple is helping to create slightly more definition in the bits that aren't stronger green. And now when I click OK, you see, I think we've gone from that to that. And that now is looking a sort of much richer kind of definition. Another thing to do if you really want to start playing around is sometimes what happens to give a sense of depth that's disappearing up is that we notice that in the background here, it's slightly softer. There isn't as much contrast that the, the, you get a stronger kind of the richer darks and what have you in the foreground. And then it gets softer as, as our, the light has to go through more haze. And what we can do if we want is we can kind of exaggerate that. So if I go to the levels, no, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Let's do this the other way around. Um, no, I will do this. I, 
I'm going to go to the levels and then I'm going to now normally we take these top bits here and move those up and down I'm going to use this this bit with the blacks here and move that and then this kind of makes everything a little bit fainter we were just kind of pulling the blacks up so and I do something like that now what I'm going to do I'm going to take that off I'm going to select go to a select area here um, quick selection because I want to select this edge of the mountain and maybe this bit of the lake maybe not that bit of lake and then come down here and we'll just select this area like that so that really now if I go back to the le levels and I I'm using the use this as a mask and what happens is everywhere we paint black remote shows us the layer below which was our original and where we leave it white um, that levels effect stays there now if I deselect that now there's a bit of a harsh line there and so what I'm going to do just soften that and just very lightly kind of run the edge on the valley bits here something like that um, and I'm just gonna take that maybe drop that down 60% something like that and just kind of take that up a little bit like that and then what we're doing is we're essentially making that little bit of further back up the valley just that little bit lighter and softer and if we really wanted to we can see we can kind of do that and it's sort of it makes the foreground um, feel like it's much more of a foreground and that the weather is kind of pushing it back anyway that's just a little extra trick to play around with you don't really have to worry too much about these things if you don't want to it's just a kind of little extra which I felt anyway whether you want to go for that or you don't um, what I would say is this notion of Contra playing a bit more with contrast with this is giving us a much richer sense of what's going on. We're getting more of the reflection off the uh, the, the C lock, lock. and um, but ultimately though I do tend to feel like you've missed a trick. That the the, you, the the mountains are really the place to go. You want to be able to see the top of the mountains to give you that sense of the the, the full majesty of the depths of the uh, depths of the fjords. Um, and then if you're worried about the exposure primarily I would say like I say expose for the snow just take it to the edge of it so it's just not so the highlights are not quite blowing but you're kind of pushing this to the edge of where you can and then bring the detail out of the shadows afterwards when you're in Photoshop so I hope that all makes sense Sandra but thank you for sending in the photo um, right, okay, so let's take a little look. What have we got here? Um, more comments. Um, where are we? Uh, right, oh, April says, uh, I'm sorry to hear about the bad weather for your trip. Um, beautiful landscape, though. Pat says, um, I, I long to see the sky. Meg says, I absolutely love the different curves of, um, of the water and the rocks together. And April says, content aware for the mountains? yeah okay <laughs> interesting idea i think the problem is is because you can't don't worry how you have the what what it will do is just extend i'll tell you okay you've you mentioned it let's try it we are live this is the thing we can do about live so let's just um flip back over here and see what happens if we do content aware because what i think will happen is it will just extend the snow up i don't think it will actually give us the top of the mountains but let's see whether you're i'm right or you're right there um april so if we take this no hold on a sec uh go back i need to be that on that level i need to tick content aware and then i will just drag this higher and see how it decides to fill it enter yeah kind of as i suspected it's just taking the top of the white and it's sort of plated around a bit it doesn't necessarily know that the mountains came to an end so it's just trying to fill in more of that space bit of a shame but um yeah <laughs> worth trying there april worth trying um and rosemary says adding the haze to the back really does add depth I'm glad you saw, I'm glad you feel that. It does. It's that sense of, generally speaking, unless you are on one of these ultra clear, sharp days, things in the background tend to have less contrast. There's more haze. The light has got to, has more atmosphere to travel through, and so things get softer. We notice it really much in fog. Does that 
in a much more immediate level. But even on a clear day, we quite often get that, unless it's a really sharp, clear day, generally speaking. And something like the, the full sense of the, the length and depth of those, those valleys, those mountains in the distance are a few miles away. There's a lot of atmosphere to be looking through, so you can enhance it that way. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, Rosemary says, uh, adding haze to the back really does add depth. Oh, yeah, we just said that. Uh, Andy says, generative AI. <laughs> yeah, that's a different thing from content. Well, it's, it's kind of an extension of content aware. Um, OK, I do actually have Photoshop beta here. Why not? Let's let's just play again here. Let's go back into here. Let's just um, undo um, the content crop. Now, what we would do with this is if I go to here, we'll take off the content aware. Let's take this up and we'll do that. So we've just got, oh no, it's gone to content aware again. I thought I unticked content aware and we'll take that up. Now, this is one of these things that um, Photoshop, for anybody who's not used, or it's, it's kind of on the, at the moment, they're really pushing this whole fact that they have this um, generative AI. So it, what it does is you type in something and it will actually create something for you. And so let's actually see what happens. All I'm going to do is I'm going to select that area there. And there's a thing here called generative fill, which has come up. And I'm going to type top of mount mountains and see what it actually does. That's a really interesting. I wouldn't have thought of doing that, Andy. But let's just actually see whether it's going to match up. Now, what it should be doing is reading the rest of the image, trying to get a sense of what's there, and then actually add something on the top which should be sympathetic to it. Um, but it's, it's the interesting bit about this is you're giving it a text prompt. Um, this is all done totally live, totally on the, the spur. I've never tried doing this, so we'll see whether it's going to. What might also have happened is I may well have lost everyone because it's now using too much. Um, it's now using too much power on my internet connection. And it's is it going to do anything, or is it just going to stay there? There we go. Oh yes, look at that top of mountains. Now I don't know whether these are the right kind of mountain tops, <laughs> um, but we now seem to have mountain tops. Um, there we go. So. Um, yes, and in fact, what it also does down here, it gives us three different versions. So we could have that version, that version. Oh, that one's given us a nice clear blue sky. That one's given us very cloudy. That one's given us a sort of somewhere in between. So you can choose your own mountains. Now, I don't know whether the tops of these mountains were quite curved and rounded, um, which almost seems to look like in, it is in the reflections down here, or whether they were these kind of pointy peaks. But you do that, suddenly we have this sunny day. Really interesting idea that, Andy. Yes, so we managed to actually add tops of mountains. The only problem is, is be, without being there, I don't know whether this is typical of the style of the top of the mountain in, in Norway, or whether they are pointier peaks, or whether they are uh, curvier peaks. Um, so I don't, Sandra doesn't seem to be with us today, so we'll just have to hope she answers us on another day. So that was an interesting exercise. Um, my apologies there for the running, if the running the uh, generative AI suddenly slowed everything down and maybe went into pause. Um, I, I was forgetting about the problem with it, with it is that it uses the internet. I don't, it doesn't process it on my computer. It throws the image into the cloud and processes it and then drags it back, which means it starts using up a lot of more of my internet connection. So it's quite possible that I went into pause here. Not entirely sure. Um, uh, oh, April says, I, oh, I see. I, um, I did hear about the new program that uh, fills it by Adobe AI. I forgot the name. That's, I think, yeah. Um, uh, oh, we are, and you are still here. Uh, Rosemary says, thanks for running the generative AI for us to all see how it works. The residents and regular tourists might be insulted that it didn't match up to the real thing, but it is interesting. April says it looks good. And he says, ethical nightmare. <laughs> but great for, um, uh, for fi getting out of a fix. Um, oh, April says there was no pause. Well, that's a relief. And John says, amazing stuff, that AI. Uh, I see lots of changes in the future. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of those things that, in a way, 
there is this whole kind of ethical ethical debate. The problem is, is that the debate has always been there. Supposing I decided I got that photo and I wanted tops of mountains. Maybe in a different one of my photos, I'd taken two or three photos. So I'd taken a photo of the top and I'd taken a photo of the bottom. So I then we then merge the photos. We've done that plenty of times. We've taken four photos in a row and then merged them together. Now we might have done it by hand or we might have even just used um, the merge photos option in our software. So we click merge and it fixes them together. It wasn't one photo, it was two photos. We could have done an up and a down, done the same thing, taken the mountain range from a different photo, even if it was in the same place, and added it onto that one. So how much of the photo is a real photo? Every week people send me images, I straighten horizons, I um, crop bits off, I take out little, I mean, VG's leaf, taking out little dots there which are distracting the eye. Photography, the idea that photography somehow tells the truth, that the camera never lies, we all know is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the camera is incapable of telling the truth. We play around with things all the time. Um, I don't talk about doing documentary photo. I'm a storyteller. I'm always saying find the story. And then what can we do in the editing process which enhances that narrative? At what point that we've added other mountains, the fact that we've got the computer to generate the mountains rather than we taking it from another photo we took, but I'm already doing content aware fill. The, the degrees by which we shift are actually minute. They're, they're where if one person draws the line, somebody else might draw that line in a different place. So the ethics of what's being created by the computer and what's being directed by the person sitting at the computer, I think there's huge room for debate. And um, obviously it's more tricky because there's one side to debate on a podcast because I'm just the one doing the talking from a couple of prompts um, on the uh, in the in the in the comments, and of course, there's even the idea that there are computer generated people out there. When you you know, there's I think there's even one or two people who um, characters on TikTok and and the likes who are AI characters, you know, and then they use whoever's programming them as such as such uses things like Chat GTP to get them to respond. So you have. AI imagery with AI responses uh, and then voice, you know, text to voice. Am I real? <laughs> yeah, well, the one thing you know that I'm not a computer generator. If I was completely computer generated, I wouldn't keep messing up the beginnings and I wouldn't keep pausing and going off on tangents. I think that kind of level of AI is way down the line. Although at that point, we start getting into Douglas Adams' um, Life of the Universe. Uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where in the future there are all these robots that have personalities um, and personality deficiencies as well, very depressed robots um, and irritating ones too. So yeah, lots of debate there. But okay, well that was an interesting that was an interesting side issue. So thank you for that suggestion, April, and thank you for that one, Andy. Um, so uh, and <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's say that that pretty much brings us to the end of today's podcast, and in a direction that I never fully intended to go. But thank you to VG and thank you to Sandra for sending in the images, and I hope thank you to everybody who's turned up here. I hope you found it interesting. Um, so what are, next week? Uh, next couple of weeks, I I have photos. I did a photo shoot. Yeah, God, there's so many different things I can do. I still have to pin it down. Keep an eye out on it. Keep following me on Facebook. Follow me on social media because don't forget I have a bunch of social media as well. So if you're on, if you happen to be on Facebook, I've got Kim Ayers of Photography on Facebook. I've also got Kim Ayers Photography on Instagram. Occasionally I write a blog, though they're kind of a bit behind, kimairsblogspot.com. And of course, you know, we've got YouTube to uh, go and see previous things too. Um, right, okay. So, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much us. Uh, right, so and now I need to go back and in a very unfluent, un-AI AI way, uh, try and find the right kind of um, buttons that I need to press. Thank you to everybody. See you all next week. Cheerio.